Hello, um, I am going to start out uh, making a video reviewing week three's reading. Um, I'm going to do my best to make it short but informative um, and also still demonstrating some of the uh, the strategies we went over last week. Um, I want to apologize if you hear a baby crying in the background or a toddler. Um, that is something I can't avoid. So um, hopefully that won't happen. It's nap time. All right. So I'm going to get into this. I'm going to try to have my face here in case some of you need to see see me talking in order to understand. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how best to do this um, while doing a screen video. Okay. Let's see. Okay, I'm showing my technological incompetence. All right, so um, what I noticed from your, first of all, your summaries and your group submissions, whether you talk to your group or not, um, they were awesome. I'm very impressed with your analyses of the text. I, in the questions that you asked, a lot of you seemed concerned about getting it right or wanting to know what my uh, interpretation is. Um, I will be reviewing it for the sake of, you know, I know you're, you're probably curious to know if, you know, what my interpretation is. Um, but there is no right or wrong, especially with a text like this. This is philosophy. This is not something, there's no right or wrong interpretation. There, there You could be totally off because you're just not reading it. You have like something in your mind that you're thinking uh, she's saying, and it could be that you got the vocabulary word totally wrong or something. But in the end, if you're reading it correctly and kind of understanding the words and you have a, basically the right context, there's no right or wrong. Um, one thing I want to say that it's not right or wrong, but it is maybe an incorrect in interpretation, um, is in philosophy, oftentimes we say the word, like in French you say, um, um means human. It means man, but also means human. So this brings up the feminist critique of our language and our use of masculine and feminine terms. Um, often masculine is the default. Um, now you might start seeing people use they or human instead of man. Um, but in this translation, they're translating the word um literally to man. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're talking about men. They're talking about, she's talking about humans. So when she says man, just think the word human. Um, but I appreciated that some of you brought up that it could be talking about man and oppression against women, because that is that was a major concern of Simone de Beauvoir's. And um, it makes sense to read this through a feminist lens. So absolutely do that. Just make sure you know that most of the time when it says man, like man knows and thinks this tragic ambivalence, this is human. Humans know and think this tragic ambivalence, which the animal and the plant merely undergo. She means human. Um, yeah, so it's not, it wasn't a wrong interpretation. I really appreciate that a lot of you are bringing in that feminist kind of perspective to it because it, it makes it an interesting lens from which to to read the text. Um, and it brings out that issue of a gender neutral pronoun that we don't have in Latin languages. Um, that would be really nice. And now uh, they, we do, they, they can be they plural or it can be a pronoun for a singular person who doesn't identify uh, with either um, him, she, hers, uh, her, she, she, her, hers, or his, him, his, his, him, yes, that's it. Okay, and I never did this. Um, I identify as she, her, hers, um, and if you, um, I should have asked you to identify your pronouns uh, for the introduction, but, um, you know, that's just an interesting thing to think about, especially with your group members. Um, think about 
going over your pronouns together. Um, it's a good exercise to do, um, just to check with people. Okay, so just to start here, um, I did, last week I actually made a video that was like 45 minutes long of me analyzing everything, and it was just rambling, and I thought you wouldn't want it, um, because my professors never did that in college. They never showed their own interpretation. They always just had students do it, and when I teach in class with the classroom with people, um, I actually don't talk, like, ever. I never talk. That's not my style. I don't do lectures. I don't do this kind of teaching. I usually do group work, we do projects, we don't do this kind of stuff, but it is interesting. So I don't mind kind of trying to do this. I'm wasting a lot of time. Okay, the continuous work of our life is to build death. Montaigne quotes the Latin poets, and I'm not going to butcher the Latin, my brother's a Latin professor, so. Man knows and thinks this tragic ambivalence which the animal and the plant merely undergo. A new paradox is thereby introduced into his destiny Rational am animal, thinking read. He escapes from his natural con natural condition without, however, freeing himself from it. This is a line that stands out to me. Um, I would focus in on this one. You have to kind of look at the context around it when you analyze it. Um, but I want to know more about what she's saying here. Uh, for whatever reason, it resonates with me. Um, and I want to figure out why. And I want to figure out what she's saying. So I'm going to look here. She says, man knows and thinks this tra tragic ambivalence which the animal and plant merely undergo. So I'm looking at the sentences around it. Here she's saying there's a tragic ambivalence. This tragic ambivalence. So when she says this, she's talking about this quote. The continuous work of our life is to build death. So that's the ambivalence. Nascentes morimur, and mur is death in French, so I'm assuming in Latin this is death, is necessary, the necessity of death. So the ambivalence is that we die. Man knows and thinks this tragic ambivalence. We think about the fact that we die, and we think about the fact that we're alive, and that there is an op opposite to death. And the plant and animal merely undergo death. They don't think about think about life or death, and they don't, as far as we know, and they don't think about the fact that they're thinking about it, and then think about the fact that they thought about it, and what, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, in philosophy, this would be beta thinking is when you are able to recognize um, something, you're able to think about something from another perspective. Alpha thinking is thinking about the fact that you were thinking about that. We are rational animals. And we can escape from the nat natural condition, but we're still part of nature. Um, this kind of makes me think of climate change and how, you know, we can escape from, we can use the internet. The internet's like, you know, when you talk to somebody through the internet, you're kind of your pure conscious self. You're not a physical self. You are the computer. And it's just a representation of our brains in a way. Um, or the brains of the people who designed it. And, um, and it's interesting to think about how we are freeing ourselves from our physical selves using the computer. Um, but our physical being is still the real truth. And it all comes to, it all ends at some point. Um, and we don't know how, we don't know when, but it does. Um, and a lot of philosophers are obsessed with the concept of everything we do is reeling towards that, but, um, or, or, or trying to free ourselves from the fact that it happens. And, and this is what she brings up later many times over and over again, is that through trying to free ourselves from the natural phenomena of, of, the cycle of life, um, we are actually creating a prison for ourselves in our minds as if it's a bad thing, as if it's bad that uh, we have this natural cycle of, of birth to death and we go back to the earth and we provide, our bodies provide to the earth and we try to escape that as human beings, but we can't escape from it. So it kind of changes your idea of what freedom is. Is freedom not dying 
Or is freedom allowing yourself to live that natural life cycle and accept it and then find meaning in the time that you have as a conscious being? Um, I believe that that is essentially her philosophy around the ambiguousness. Um, okay. He is still part of this world of which he is a consciousness. He asserts himself as a pure internality against which no external power can take hold. And he also experiences himself as the thing crushed by the dark weight of other things. A lot of you brought out this quote. It really does stand out. Um, partially the quotes that are most well written. You have to think about it. Sometimes things aren't confusing because you don't understand it. Sometimes things are confusing because the translator didn't do a good job translating. Um, at times like that, I try to find maybe another version of it. Um, I'm trying to find another PDF version with a different translation just so you can compare. Um, I haven't found that yet, but there is a book if you have a Kindle or something and you want to do a free trial for Audible. Um, you uh, you can download the, uh, during your free trial, you get a free book. So you can download the Audible version of, of it. It's a different translation, but it might help you kind of, the comparison between the two uh, could help you kind of understand it and understand when it's not you, it's, it's them. <laughs> um, so he asserts himself as a pure internality against which no external power can take hold. Hmm. He asserts himself. So asserts is a very active thing to do, as a pure internality. So we assert, we are, we're trying to make ourselves something that's purely internal, against which no external power can take hold. It's really interesting, again, she didn't have a computer, she did, computers didn't exist, but thinking about it, like how computers and how it's just bringing up to me because I'm thinking about virtual learning so much. Um, how computers really represent our, our external manifestation of our internal selves against which no external power can take hold. And he also, at the same time, experiences himself as a thing crushed by the dark weight of other things. So while we are an individual, we can't escape the fact that we have an environment. We are an individual within an environment. And whenever you meet somebody, whenever you talk to somebody, you have to think of them as an individual within an environment, not just a collective, not just a collective of other humans, but the environment and the geography and the socioeconomic environment, the physical environment, the geographical environment, the home, the school, the community, the state, the country, the larger world, and then the universe all impact that one individual, all of those factors. It's kind of like that quote, you know, you think about, especially right now with the tough times that we're going through, every time you meet somebody, just assume, you know, if they're rude to you, assume they're having a tough day. You know, you think about that person being person within their environment, that environment could be crushing them in some way and just have some empathy for that person. Um, if you, I, I think that's where she, she's not talking about empathy here, that's not what she's saying, but it reminds me of that concept of you, every person um, thinks themselves invincible, but really we are just individuals um, that either are thriving or are being uh, affected by in some way our environment. At every moment, he can grasp the non-temporal truth of his existence. This was another quote. A lot of you chose quotes from the beginning, which is totally fine. You don't need to explain yourself for doing that. Um, I think the beginning and the end of everything, of every paper that you read or every book, those are the really important parts. So it, it makes sense that you did. Um, at every moment, he can grasp the non-temporal -tempor truth of his existence. So the 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 truth that is not um, weighed down by time of his existence. But between the past, which no longer is, and the future, which is not yet, this moment when he exists is nothing. So this is her philosophy. This privilege, which he alone possesses, of being a sovereign and unique subject amidst a universe of objects, is what he shares with all his fellow men. In turn, an object for others, he is nothing more than an individual in the collectivity on which he depends. How did she get there? So how did she get from 
non-temporal truth of his existence to this. <laughs> okay. But between the past, which no longer is, and the future, which is not yet, this moment when he exists is nothing. This privilege, which he alone possesses, of being a sovereign and unique subject amidst a universe of objects is what he shares with his fellow men. This is the ambiguousness, this nothingness of our present selves. Kind of reminds you of like when you meditate or if you've ever done a yoga class or something, they always talk about being present, right? You have to learn on being present. Technology can keep you from being present. External things can keep you from being present. Being present is, is really truly existing in your physical self. In between, she doesn't mean the relationship. She means literally in the middle of the past and the future. And it's hard to tell if she's kind of saying this privilege as in this or this privilege as in this. She's saying this privilege of being a sovereign and unique subject. So we're a subject because um, our existence is subjective. We, we can think beyond our, our physical existence. Amidst a universe of objects, a subject can control an object, but sometimes a subject is treated as an object, is what he shares with all his fellow men. So the only beings who share our ambiguity, our, our difficult experience of being conscious beings, our fellow men, and, and that means you are by definition not alone. And turn an object for others. He is nothing more than an individual. So he's a subject amidst the universe of objects, but he is an object for other people. He is nothing more than an individual in the collectivity on which he depends. As long as there, okay, so we need to think about each paragraph as having its own meaning. Um, each paragraph in like one of your essays, each paragraph has one purpose, to communicate one thing, and you kind of show your thought process of getting to communicate that one thing. So I like to th try to think about what her purpose of writing this is. It's clearly her introduction. Um, she kind of rambles. They said in those videos that she doesn't have the same constraints as other authors during her time because she was a woman and, and didn't feel like she was really gonna get published anyway. So she kind of wrote exactly how she was feeling, which is why I think she was able to transcend uh, her time period and become one of the great philosophers. Um, she rambles, for sure. And she repeats herself a lot. So what is the main... Man knows and thinks it's traffic. She's introducing the idea of the ambiguousness of life and that it's related to death, it's related to our consciousness of being a conscious being, um, a subject amongst objects. So the point is to introduce ambiguity. As long as there have been men and they have lived, they have all felt this tragic ambiguity of their condition. So now she's kind of le defining it even more but as long as, and providing context. But as long as there have been philosophers and they have thought, most of them have tried to mask it. And now she's giving context of philosophy. Philosophers have tried to cover it up, have tried to, it, tried to avoid thinking about the ambiguity of, con of our condition. They've done things like um, believed in uh, uh, believed in certain powers that had control over our existence and our destiny and our fate um, in order to say that our lives are not ambiguous. In fact, they, they believe that it in fact has a lot of meaning and that everything is on purpose. Uh, everything was written out for us before it happened. Um, and she's trying to say that that is not the case, that the ambigu ambiguity of our condition is really hard to take and most people try not to uh, try not to take it, try to not look at it in the head, and try to circumvent it in order to survive. It's very hard to survive knowing or thinking that 
your life has no other meaning other than to exist in this very moment. Um, okay, they have striven to reduce mind to matter or to reabsorb matter into mind. Those who have accepted the dualism, what is the dualism? So this is a clarifying question. I need to, the dualism of mind versus matter, I'm assuming have established a hierarchy between body and soul, yeah, which permits of considering a negligible, as negligible, the part of the self which cannot be saved. They have denied death, either by integrating it with life or by promising to man immortality. Or again, they have denied life, considering it as a veil of illusion beneath which is hidden the truth of nirvana. And the ethics which they have proposed to their disciples has always pursued the same goal. It has been a matter of eliminating the ambiguity by making oneself pure inwardness or pure externality, by escaping from the sensible world or by being engulfed in it, by yielding to eternity or enclosing oneself in the pure moment. Um, it, she says people try to be either completely internal, completely meditative, or completely external, completely absorbed by the material world, completely objective. And in philosophy, that would be called positivist, is you only believe in the objects that are right in front of you. Um, and that those are two extremes, and that she thinks that in the ambiguity that she focuses on is in between those two things. That's the duality of the external self and the internal self. And the ambiguity is, is that we are both and um it's very hard to accept that um we can be both external and internal individuals and a collective at the present time there still exist many doctrines which choose to leave in the shadows certain troubling aspects of a too complex situation but their attempt to lie to us is in vain doctrine. So she's saying there's too many, too many um, different ways that humans both try to tell other people how to think um, and how to feel and too many ways that people try to search for a leader to tell them how to feel because they can't accept that they themselves can create their own meaning. Um, there's a book called Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe that um, is talking about a village, an African village, uh, I think in Nigeria, pretty sure it's Nigeria. It's not good, I don't remember. Um, and it's before, col colonial, before the colonists came. Um, and one of the things that they believed in this village was that you had a chi. Every person had an internal god. Um, so that's that concept of, of it, it, this concept of you creating your own meaning exists in a lot of different cultures and a lot of religions. Um, and it, it exists in religions, very popular religions and theologies today, but we use different vocabulary to express them. So even if you don't agree with Simone de Beauvoir um, on a literal level, um, you can find vocabulary in your theology and in your philosophy that uh, is a different way of expressing what she's trying to say here um, about man being in charge of his own fate, um, about man, humans um, creating their own meaning. This paragraph, she talks about the atomic bomb. Uh, Again, skimming is really great. You can kind of kind of blur your eyes almost. Relax your eyes and look at a paragraph and see what words stand out to you. So I see metaphysics, uncontrollable forces, object, subject, atomic bomb, Stalingrad and Buchenwald. So now I'm thinking about World War II. I'm thinking about humans using each other as objects to a means, as a means to an end. Um, so she's getting into how when we are controlled by a doctrine, we are um, giving away our freedom and actually accepting a world where we can use other humans 
um, as a means to an end. We are creating a world. We are acting like we're the masters of our universe. Um, but and we create, <laughs> we create objects that can hurt us. Uh, it's very, it's a strange thing, right, for a species to create objects that can hurt themselves. Um, what I think part of what she's saying here is once you accept the ambiguity of your existence, the difference between human beings blurs and you become a species again. You don't become separate people from separate states, from separate um, backgrounds. You are all human beings. And um, when you create something in the mind that you are protecting your state, like the atomic bomb, like a country creating the atomic bomb, um, trying to scare the rest of the world, you're creating something to destroy your own species. And that's a very strange concept. Okay. I I'm going to take a break because this video is getting too long. So I'm going to come back in the next video.